Welcome everyone to today's program. I am Brooke Murphy, writer and reporter for Becker's Hospital Review. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit questions you have during the program by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during this time. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Uh, Jonathan Wick brings 20 years of experience in acute care and insurance to TransUnion, where he helps TransUnion Healthcare Solutions offer the most patient-centric patient access collections and recovery systems in the market. Mr. Wick frequently speaks at national and state events and has developed nationally recognized programs for POS and financial clearance. He currently serves on the Colorado HFMA board and is president of the board of directors at an assisted living facility in Boulder, Colorado. He is silver certified in lean and holds a bachelor's degree in sports medicine, a master's degree in health administration, and an MBA. Prior to joining TransUnion for a second time, Jason Lurch served as vice president of consulting services at Ensemble Health Partners, a principal of healthcare, a principal of healthcare at TransUnion Healthcare, and the director of revenue cycle at Health Management Associates. His primary responsibilities have included evaluating new products and business partnership opportunities managing the outsourced partner strategy, including self-pay collections, eligibility services, specialized collection services, and day one programs, which have resulted in substantially improved yields and reductions of cost. From 2005 to 2012, he held increasingly progressive positions at community health, community health systems, most recently assistant chief financial officer and director of patient financial services. During his tenure, Jason was part of the team that built a regional service center where he managed the rev revenue cycle continuum for seven Pennsylvania hospitals. He is currently a principal at TransUnion Healthcare and a member of ACHE and HFMA. Jason leads and speaks on topics related to healthcare technology and efficient business practices. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Jonathan to begin today's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us and taking time out of your busy day to uh, listen to Jason and I talk through uh, patients as one of your funding mechanisms in your hospital, hospital's revenue cycle. Uh, as, as Brooke mentioned, there's some time at the end where we have some questions, and we'll be monitoring those as we go. So uh, feel free to um, uh, put those in in that little applet on the right, and then we'll prioritize them based off the content and try to get to them. Um, uh, we do want this to be dynamic. So we've got about, oh, 40, 45 minutes of slides, uh, and so we should have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end uh, to get through those, but we'll dive in here. Uh, Jason and I today are going to give you kind of three big buckets of information, uh, basically a market overview, uh, talk about what's going on in the industry right now, some marketing challenges uh, facing hospitals in terms of uh, impacts and downstream effects of cost shifting to the patient. Uh, uh, and, and how revenue cycles, uh, specifically on the front and the back end of the revenue cycle, are addressing those challenges. Um, we'll talk about patient experience, uh, consumerism. Uh, that word gets a lot of play, and we'll define it for you very specifically at TransUnion and what we feel it is and how our products can help meet that. Uh, medical debt, uh, collections behaviors uh, that are happening both on the hospital and patient side. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll kind of talk you out of the mess, if you will, um, and, and walk you through some best practices and strategies and workflows that we've seen both from our customer base um, in our rounds around the industry and in, in going in and out of hospitals and health systems, as well as um, some of the tools that are within TransUnion's wheelhouse to help hospitals meet their needs. <clears throat> we'll talk about market trends here for a minute. So if food increased at the same rate as health care, this is what you'd be spending at the grocery store. These are some alarming numbers. Um, you know, eggs and, and milk and, and, and oranges are all something that's stocked within my refrigerator. Um, we'd go bankrupt uh, with my two growing boys <laughs> very quickly um, if, if that's what we spent. But uh, this was uh, based off a national health expender survey in, in 2011. If, if uh, uh, common goods or groceries increased, increased at the inflationary rate that health care costs do, uh, we can have a whole speech or talk on why health care costs are high. Uh, it's the usual suspects. 
um, uh, technology has turned healthcare into a very Burger King type society. I want it now. I want it faster. The guy across the street, I want it my way. Um, and so you see a lot of freestanding EDs, um, hospitals going up across the street from each other, um, a, a lessening primary care base uh, with the expansion of Medicaid. And so there's a lot of volume coming into the system uh, and, and one could argue on how much value is coming out of it in regards to that. Um, so hospitals are having to shift their, their uh, reimbursement uh, strategies to meet that need. Um, secondarily, you know, you've got outside costs that are, that are, that are causing uh, disruption in the market c concerning uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, high technology, um, and of course the, the elderly and uh, uh, chronic, chronic, chronic care population. Uh, the studies out there that show that, you know, 20% of your patients are representing 80% of your costs. Um, so that's most of the dozen of the eggs, and, and uh, you'll, you're starting to see a movement now in population health management to help address and identify those patients and get them into an evidence-based practice to help with that. Nonetheless, um, I don't know about you guys, I ain't paying no 145 bucks for oranges. Um, and so I, I think that's how the cost structure has set up with our patients with these two to $3,000 deductibles. And so hospitals are going to be increasingly challenged in defending their charge master. Um, in, in terms of what those prices are and how that reimbursement structure looks. So uh, that was the intention of giving you uh, that slide. Um, I have this present, this uh, visual in most of my presentations. Um, it, you're not re really necessarily meant to understand what all the percentages are. It may be hard to see as well, but pay attention to the colors. Um, I've been uh, talking nationally probably for the last decade, and I've Loved adding a year to this slide and watching it shrink. Um, when I first started talking about point of service collections uh, with different entities, you know, that was in the in the in the early 2000s, and there was only five or six layers of this grid. Uh, now we're into you know 2014, and and what you'll see is the conventional kind of indemnity plans represented the majority of the market, 75% of that market. You know, those were you know you you, you paid 10 bucks and and you got what you needed. And then you had HMOs come, and PPOs, and finally high deductible health plans and self 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 offering plans. Um, and and now you see that these indemnity or conventional HMO plans represent you know less than 40 percent, and 86 percent are these 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 plans that quote don't have first dollar coverage. And so patients have to pay their health care just like they would. Um, automobile insurance these days. So they're starting to go through this windshield exercise, I call it. Well, if I submit this claim, will my premiums go up? And will I have to pay out of pocket for this windshield? How much does the windshield cost? And so we're starting to see that in healthcare with these deductibles and the positioning, and it is prevalent in the market. Um, you don't see HMOs coming back at all. They've, they've dramatically decreased in the last few years, and, and I think we're going to continue to see that. Um, I'm not so sure deductibles are the answer. You'll see some stuff from Jason and I today that challenge that. Um, it's certainly an innovative way to help premiums stay down, but it's created these medical debt issues downstream, and, and I think we'll continue to see that as we go. Uh, to that point, deductibles uh, have uh, doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, this comes from the uh, U.S. News and World Report index report uh, that comes out uh, every year, and they track all kinds of different things, but the red line in the middle um, out of all that spaghetti is deductibles, and it's got a pretty steady statistical uh, graph. 81% uh, of employed workers now have a deductible. That's amazing, gang, 81%. So if you've got someone that's got insurance, they're coming into your hospital, they do not have, an, have dollars to pay that account typically coming in. Um, the deductibles also increased in value um, or an amount that needs to be paid. It, it started out at 500 about 10 years ago, and it's running right just shot south of 1300 now. Um, to make matters worse, our government's trying to help. Um, <laughs> they've created, uh, through the ACA expansion, uh, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum plans. These are the uh, levels of uh, deductible for, for the, the, the nation this year in 2016. Um, bronze is uh, approaching $5,400. Uh, silver is at $3,500. Gold and platinum are $1,400 and $400, respectfully. Uh, that's a lot of dollars. There's some studies out there that show that most Americans have somewhere in the neighborhood of $500 to $1,000 maybe in the bank. So that means they have to go out and borrow money uh, if they have, an, have a, a study done at a facility or a hospital and, 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 and they're in one of these plans. So while the ACA created coverage, it indirectly has also created this downstream medical debt that's happening. 
and, and it's just something that, that's been fascinating to me and I'm very passionate about as I'm following it uh, throughout my career and, and uh, uh, having worked in a hospital and, and, and seeing these deductibles just kind of go up year after year has, has really been compelling. This is another graphic that's showing just, you know, the out-of-pocket uh, that, 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 that has dramatically increased over the last 14 years. Uh, the, the blue represents what patients' contributions are. The yellow is what uh, employers are uh, contributing to, to the uh, cost of health insurance. Um, we're at $16,000 now combined. Uh, about 4,500 of that is coming out uh, from the employee and their premium. That's a lot. Uh, that was about the worth of my probably first car. <laughs> Um, uh, and, uh, and you know, and you can't buy a car for that now, but that's certainly a lot of money that is being shelled out to um, an insurance plan that's really there to, to help uh, when something bad goes wrong, which may or may not happen. But uh, when coupled with a deductible that, that's, you know, thousands of dollars, uh, they've really turned into a catastrophic funding mechanism and not really much coverage at all. That all brings forth this concept of underinsured. If you take anything away from what Jason and I are talking to you about today. I think this underinsured concept is something that should resonate with you. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund helped us define it. They, they went across kind of three areas or, or, or spheres, uh, out-of-pocket costs that are 10% or more of your household income or 5% of your household income if your federal poverty 200% or lower um, or if your deductible is 5% or more. So, you know, those graphs I was showing you earlier with those bronze and silver plans, the government's pushing you towards a silver plan that deductible, you know, is the $3,500 range. That is easily surpassing the 5% uh, of a household income if you start doing a demographic across our nation. So uh, very, very uh, interesting dynamic that's happening in terms of underinsured. We're seeing more and more, pre uh, more and more prevalence with that as we go. We'll talk about the patient and how they're um, being impacted. As medical debt, it absolutely is a problem. Uh, Consumer uh, Finance Protection Bureau finds that half of debt collections appear on uh, are a result of, of medical actions that, are, that appear on credit reports. A, Kersey, a, a Kaiser Family Foundation report found that a third of Americans struggle to pay medical bills, and, and that 70% of those, the majority of which, actually have insurance. Um, unpaid medical bills still represent the highest cause of bankruptcy. So, you know, I'm hoping someday and praying that that goes away. <laughs> but right now, bankruptcies are still mostly caused, for the most part, by medical bills. And then once in debt, this part really pulls up my heartstrings working in a hospital, but that, you know, people aren't getting care because they're afraid of going into bankruptcy or being able to fund their care. And those of you listening on the phone, I mean, that's, that's where this is, this is really important is to try to engage patients financially um, up front. Jason will get into that in his part of the presentation here. Um, uh, so cost sharing levels now exceed the, the resources that most families had. I alluded to this earlier. The Federal Reserve found that about half Americans would be able to completely cover an emergency expense costing $400 without borrowing money. Um, you saw what those deductible levels were earlier. So, you know, we're less than a third of that. So that they're $800 underwater through either credit, borrowing money from mom or dad or a brother or sister, um, maxing out a, a credit card or, or, or you know, uh, exhausting their bank account. So it's uh, people don't really save for their health care. It kind of becomes a reactive type spend. And, and with that, um, we're starting to see lots of financial uh, detriments. 42% uh, of patients find it difficult to afford health care, according to Kaiser Family Health Foundation. Uh, that, that sits behind uh, utilities, housing, food, and transportation. And this difficulty in affording this health care greatly is um, increased among the uninsured um, and, and with those with lower incomes. So what Kaiser Family is saying here, and they're a great resource for this stuff, kff.org, I, I live by it, I go look at it at least once a week to go see what's going on, and th they're measuring this, this behavioral aspect that's happening to patients as they uh, uh, onboard to care. And what they're saying here is, you know, almost half of patients find difficulty in affording bills, and they rank that above things like your house, your food, and your car, um, which is incredible to me, and then it's amplified if you're un if you're uninsured, um, which kind of makes sense, and it's, it's an afterthought, really. We're going to get to one of our poll questions here. Uh, we've got, I think, three or four of these in our presentation here, and, and we do need you to grab your mouse and, and uh, go look at the poll, um, but at one point in the revenue cycle, are patients primarily being evaluated in your organization? Are you doing it all front? Are you doing it at registration when patients come in? Are you doing it at an early out or pre bill process? Are you just doing traditional collections? You'd be amazed. There are hospitals out there that are still just collecting it downstream and, 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 and hoping that those deductibles aren't going to be an impact. 
um, are you doing some sort of multiple of above? Are you doing none of above? Or you're not sure? Um, I'm hoping that we don't get a lot of ease <laughs> um, in the answer of this, the multiples, because I really want to understand like where people are focusing. Um, uh, best practice hospitals are having this happen at scheduling, pre-access, and pre-reg. So uh, we'll, we'll sit here for a minute and see how the polls are going. All right, and do we get our answers back? Can you see them? So Jason will go over what, what you guys said here. And it looks like most folks are reporting they are doing it in the scheduling pre-access, pre-registration arena. So that's good to hear. Um, number two is coming in in uh, post-bill collections and then 17% uh, in registration area. So have a handful that are not sure, and that's ticking up a little bit. But uh, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for starting off here. And uh, we're going to advance and talk about uh, where the patient fits into this experience. And they're finding themselves uh, stuck navigating, or uh, trying to navigate the system. Um, so this is a article that came out from uh, Robert Wood Johnson. And they talked about how even providers are unaware of how much medical interventions cost. So for the patient's perspective, it's very difficult to navigate. We're still in an era where it's clear and easy. Next slide talks about how the average collections rate drop rapidly with time. So certainly there's a lot of benefit uh, for the hospital to try to collect at the time of service. And this is a good study that came out from J.P. Morgan, which talks about the um, uh, shift in the payer source from, uh, from payer to employer, um, and then from provider to consumer. Uh, the trend certainly continues. This is a real good article from Moody's, and this talks about how um, high deductibles are tomorrow's bad debt, and uh, the providers, if they don't collect the time of service, they will absolutely struggle uh, and potentially will uh, end up with a lot of these accounts in bad debt. This next slide talks about propensity to pay and uh, the correlation with deductible size and how the larger out-of-pocket for patients, uh, the less likely they are to pay them. So certainly a trend, as we see, John had talked before about the uh, the bronze plans with those high out-of-pockets. Um, this one talks about certainly how, uh, this is a Becker's piece actually, how um, consumers um, don't understand the plan and they certainly just are not able to, uh, um, pick up um, next one here is payment uh, predictability and uh, the fact that uh, insurers, however, that's uh, the employer, um, So uh, J Jason was talking here about the patient is the new payer. So very rarely do patients understand deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance. So this is a practice manager from the cardiovascular disease specialist in Pittsburgh. And they, they mentioned that if they bill an insurance company, the downstream debt is actually um, captured a lot quicker than it would be for the patient. And so we'll talk a little bit about rally a relay and some studies that come up as well. But if a patient gets a bill for $600, you're lucky you get paid $25 a month. So you're immediately put into a situation of um, uh, collecting from a patient, which is much, much more difficult than collecting from an insurer. Uh, Medicare, the largest payer in the world, uh, you know, pays most hospitals back inside of 30 to 40 days. Um, and they're actually probably a hospital's best payer. Um, a patient is going to becoming a, is going to start becoming a payer to you. And if they, not, if they aren't already, and I encourage you to go back and look at that revenue mix and understand where your revenue is coming from as a, as a funding source for your patients. And so, um, uh, you know, a, a, a patient uh, may or may not get a bill pre-service uh, based off the survey that Jason shared with us. Um, most of you, which we were very pleased to see, is uh, having a self-pay, um, or, or I'm sorry, a uh, pre-service conversation with your patient. Those of you that weren't sure, go back and ask. Um, if you're not sure how your folks are having that conversation, best practice is having it up front and multiple times. I think Jason would agree that you know you want to have this conversation happen as many times as you can um, uh, to avoid what this cardiovascular surgeon is saying. So if you build downstream, you basically are relying on an envelope to collect your cash. And envelopes can't have a conversation like we're having today. I can't talk to a Mr. Lurch and say, Mr. Lurch, you know, how can you, do you have the ability to pay $600 or not? He's just going to see a statement and shuffle it in the mail 
and take a go, and, and it may sit there. There's studies out there that say a, a medical bill gets subordinated, you know, to number six or seven as we go down. Um, McKinsey also did a study here and said that collecting patient payments adds to the cost of hospitals. Um, on average, healthcare consumers pay more than twice as slowly as commercial insurers. So this is or payers. This is this is the point I was alluding to earlier. They are significantly higher, as much as three times higher. So if you're getting your cost to collect from Aetna or United or Cigna or Anthem or, or Medicare is is you know uh, fifty or uh, five cents on the dollar, you're going to pay fifteen cents on the dollar to get that money from a patient and collecting that deductible. Uh, when I was working in the hospital, we were starting to look at liability and risk as it was framed in terms of which where was our dollars coming from the insurance company and where were our dollars coming from the patient and what's that liability. And when we went back to the insurance companies to negotiate our rates, they may be giving us a 6% increase, but 4% of that's coming from the patient because they've got a structured uh, benefit plan that has deductibles and things that are that much higher. So it was important for us to understand what our debt and cost to collect under these new plans was so that we could, we could continue with that. This is a graph from, from Relay. It's one of my favorites. Um, it talks through how, like Jason was alluding to, alluding to dollars and their value over time, first of all, um, and then also what your cost to collect is over time. So as a claim ages or as receivables age, your cost to collect should slowly goes up. That's this yellow line that you see. Um, the receivables devalue over time as well. And so what Relay is saying here is a dollar collected today, you hear this a lot in the industry, especially from HMA, is, you know, 75% tom tomorrow. That's typically, you know, when that gets released at the 60-day mark or at the 90-day mark. And, and, you know, this is a world which Jason lived in at HMA. Um, this was, you know, a world that I lived in at my hospital to where we wanted to keep as much stuff to the left of this graph as we can. I know all of you that work in hospitals have a report that comes out maybe weekly or monthly that shows by bucket what your age accounts are from dollars by payer and by patient um, and, or by patient by payer. And, and, and that last uh, sorting is something that you probably want to think about is, you know, is the patient liability or, or your self-pay bucket. Some hospitals have that as a pure self-pay. They don't have any insurance at all or they have it as self-pay with the balance after insurance. What's the aging on that? How long are your patients taking to pay? Not just your insurance companies. It's a dynamic that you want to look at. Because if you're getting into the 180, 185 day realm, Relay is saying here that you're lucky to get back a nickel off the dollar that you have, you know, 5%. So um, your chances of collecting that money and the patient's propensity to pay as, as the account ages dramatically goes down. And you're also going to spend a lot more resources. You're going to turn that out to early out self-pay if you use that. If you're doing it in-house, you're spending labor costs, and if it goes to a third-party collection agency, you're spending, you know, 10 to 15 points in the market. Um, if you're above that, give us a call. <laughs> but you know, 10 to 15 points in the market in, in terms of collection costs, so um, it dramatically impacts your cash cycle as it comes through. We had another poll question here. I'll let let Jason tell us the results as we come through. But uh, which of the following organization would you would you would you cover in the in the months? Uh, we've got uh, propensity to pay. Financial assistance, procedure estimation, um, and then I imagine uh, it's uh, you've got probably two of the above and all of the above as choices. Um, so you know, let me know which one of those things you think your organization is going to focus on, uh, based off what Jason and I have talked about today. Looks like we're on 46% for patient procedure estimation, 27% for propensity to pay, 14% for financial assistance, and. Uh, We've got a couple of folks chiming in with none of the above balance. So okay, cool. Those of you that are none of the above, and we'll continue to go up. If they change, Jason will certainly jump in. You know, the none of the aboves. Um, if you're relying traditionally on your billing cycle, the market's changed, and and you know you may it may be a function of your payer mix. You may have a low population of commercial plans. Um, you may not have a lot of health benefit exchange plans through the ACA. Um, uh, you may not know. Um, I encourage you to go back. You know, I want you to take some things from this 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 uh, presentation that Jason and I are giving today, and take them back to your organization and show them the slide and, and say, hey, are we working on these things? Do, do we have a plan to work on these things? Talk to your patient access department and, and see um, and, and where they're at. Um, in my experience, in in my talking and in my service with HFMA and and, and making my rounds on the on the kind of uh, conference circuit. 
Um, I was at A and I and Nahum and and uh, uh, heading out to Becker's at the end of the week. Uh, the, these top three are where hospitals are focusing. They, they are they are starting to look at finance options for their for their for their patients. Um, as weird as that sounds, they're looking at what funding mechanisms can be established at or in advance of care. Um, and with that, you got to have a dovetailed estimation, you know, happening first. Because if you don't know what the costs are, you've got $55 eggs out there, for example, instead of $3 eggs. The patients are going to have this perception that they're paying $3 for their dozen of eggs, not $55. To put that in perspective, you know, they may be in a CT scanner for five minutes. That's a $1,200 study on average, gang, for five minutes. I don't know about you, but if my wife found out that I spent $1,200 on something that lasted five minutes, I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> so even if it was a healthcare intervention, so having those conversations in advance, understanding the patient's ability to pay, uh, determining the difference between the willingness and ability to pay is huge um, as we progress through this. So. We'll get back into what can change now that we've thoroughly depressed you. Jason and I have kind of walked through what um, what what uh, what things have happened from a industry standpoint. We want to kind of pull you back in and talk about what solutions and, and tools are out there, what's working in hospitals, what's not working, um, what's the industry saying. So AHA is starting to chime in now. They've, they've kind of steered clear of this, but you're starting to see more of the American Hospital Association um, speak to this. and. And, and uh, they've talked about Dallas and, and Tenet. Tenet's a very large corporation. They've reported more bad debt tied to patients with high deductible insurance coverage. We're hearing from our members that a number of patients who are unable to pay their bills, resulting in bad debt, because the plant, the level of these plants is increasing from, from Mrs. Steinberg here. Um, she's the vice president out there at AHA. Hospitals tell us around a quarter of bad debt comes from patients that are actually insured. That number should absolutely alarm you. One in four of your patients that go to bad debt according to the AHA, have some result of a high deductible plan. That is, that is insanely scary to me if, um, and, and your billing cycle. Uh, McKinsey's chiming back in again. They say about over half of the consumers uh, would pay uh, two to $500 up front. 74% uh, of, of the consumer, shared consumers um, say they're both uh, uh, at, uh, indicated that we are both able and willing to pay their out-of-pocket medical expense. Um, and so what McKinsey is saying here is that there's behaviors that are out there and patients really want to know the cost. How many of us have gone into an ED or an emergency room, had our insurance card and our credit card at the ready, um, and, 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 and just waiting to pay, but no one asks, and we go home and go, well, I guess they'll send me a bill. And then that bill comes and it's like 25 grand. And you're like, why didn't anybody ask me about this when I was there? I probably wouldn't have had as much stuff happen. So it's just this really nasty kind of, um, uh, 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 dialogue that, that, that happens. Um, Pre-service estimates, GE says pre-service estimates improved denial rates. Uh, capturing patient payments at or point of service is a key success factor. They offset compensated care. Uh, Becker's uh, also is chiming in here. They're saying it's more important than ever for hospitals to maintain a steady stream of income. They're talking about the high deductible plan impact. And as more time passes by, we've talked about that, the prevention to pay decreases substantially. So some components of a successful program, um, uh, metrics, executive level to support, so top, top down, um, bottom up, sideways, upside down, you name it, but everybody needs to be living, breathing, and, and, and doing the culture of collections. Uh, active participation at all levels, having a policy and a procedure and a protocol in place. Who are we collecting from? Why are we collecting from them? What happens if they don't have their wallet? What happens if they do have their wallet but can't afford it? You know, what are all those traps and steps that you have? And then how do your patients know? Is this just something we're going to turn on tomorrow? Um, or are we going to have a campaign around it to help them understand? So some best practices, adopt principles and communicate the message. You can't communicate enough. Those of us that have taken, you know, satisfaction surveys, um, either as an employee or anywhere else, they've always come up as communication being an opportunity for us. Uh, update the mission. Our mission in our hospital, well, it actually did update <laughs> um, when we did that, uh, and, 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 and it, it didn't change that much, but, um, you know, within their ability to pay, I think, changed from regardless of their ability to pay. And so, you know, patients do have a role in paying for their care. It's not free, and if it should be free, there should be a process to get them into that bucket. But couple patients with that best funding mechanisms, and sometimes that's charity. Capitalize on your contact opportunities. So where is it that your patients are coming into your hospital and you're having conversations? Every one of them 
should have a financial conversation where it can. Bedside registration pre-discharge pre for inpatients. ED pre-discharge. I've, I've, I've heard hospitals call it a cage where <laughs> patients go out and they get seen by a financial counselor or registrar and then get discharged. Um, or they're discharged and they, hey, stop by registration on your way out and, and uh, talk about payment. They've actually integrated that into their, their, their discharge process. Yes, it has impacts to your patient engagement, but I'll tell you what, it's going to offset the patient engagement dissatisfaction from not doing anything. The patient's first and last impression in a hospital is a bill. Hi, how are you, Mr. Wick? Welcome to our hospital. Can I have your ID and insurance card? Here's a bill. So closing that process in the middle and amplifying it and weaving it into your process is huge. This is a really nice deck that, or slide that goes through just gates. If you can think about eligibility, verification, estimation, and collection, um, these are the big gates that happen in most revenue cycles from a financial clearance standpoint. So each one of these has tools, and whether you're getting a green check or a red X as you go through, think about your processes in your hospital and how you're doing each one of these cans or buckets, eligibility, verification, estimation, and collection. A lot of you I bet are doing eligibility. If you're not, um, you know, th there's a lot of denials that are happening at your hospital, I can guarantee that. But a lot of you I bet have some sort of process, hopefully it's not telephonic, but you're doing EDI transactions back and forth to a clearinghouse of some sort, um, getting a 270, 271 transactions telling you, does the patient that's in front of you have benefits at the hospital that they're at? Uh, what are the levels of those benefits? Uh, and so that you can start moving on to that process. Secondly, you're going to look at the, the authorizations and referrals. You know, most insurance carriers have a notification rule, so they're UR you know, nurses at the case management side at the insurance level can get involved in, quote, managing the care. That's where the term came from, gang, manage care. Insurance companies want to be involved in managing that care so they can keep that premium dollar down. And so that's why these notification rules are in place so that they know that a patient's there, so they can be engaged with that process, establish things like medical necessity, pre-op, pre-cert, so on and so forth. Of all the things I'm hearing the most, this seems to be the most where most hospitals are bleeding. Um, there's a lot of revenue leakage right now in this bucket for pre-cert, authorizations, notifications, and MedNet. Patient estimation, um, it, it, it seems to be evolving, um, would be where, where I, I, would, I would say. Uh, there, there, some hospitals may have started with a matrix of some sort where they've gotten, you know, a, here's a list of CTs or uh, imaging, surgery, rehab, this is what I'm going to collect. Um, here's what I think you're going to have. Our hospital started with duct tape and, and, and pieces of paper. Hey, if a patient shows up that's self-pay, collect this. Um, did we over-collect sometimes? Sure, and we dial it as we learned. We finally got into getting an estimator, which greatly improved, improved the conversation and was much more prof professional in its presentation. You know, Mr. Lurch, here's your, here's your uh, estimate today. Um, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is your insurance covers it. The bad news is, is that is that they, uh, they, they got an amount here that you need to owe. How will you be paying for that today? Notice how I said, what will you, uh, do you want to pay that? I didn't say that. You don't want to ask patients whether or not they want to pay. You want to ask for the amounts that they should pay. Um, and having that est estimator there as part of your collections process helps with that. As I mentioned earlier, pre-service collections is a best practice. Point of service is the next best thing. Um, most patients don't want that shock or surprise when they come in um, saying, hey, uh, I don't know if anybody told you yet, but, but before your service today, we, not, we got to take care of a payment on your deductible. Ideally, the patient should know about that before they come in. Uh, I'm gonna, you're going to start seeing a lot more patient payment plans happen, loans. I really think patients are going to start getting um, finance for their care in advance, as nauseating as that sounds. But I do think in the next, uh, before 2020, you're going to start seeing OR schedules to where there's a hip surgery or a knee replacement, an elective study of some sort, get pre-funded with payment plans prior to that patient coming in. It won't be the balance, but that funding mechanism will be established. And if, and if the funding mechanism isn't a payment plan, it'll be charity or secondary coverage or a down payment um, or a special case agreement. Um, hospitals are doing all kinds of creative things now to make sure the care is funded in advance. AHA recommends that educating patient population um, is, is already happening, as I mentioned. So proactive education of your patients is huge. Work with patients up front to understand the financial obligations to develop strategies to help patients pay their bills over time. Employers have a role, too. They can ease the burden on health care providers by making sure their workers understand benefits. So the HR departments are kind of interesting in this, right? So they sell a benefit plan, but are they educating to the deductibles and levels on that plan? And are they talking about going to the primary care physician doctor office versus the ER? 
Um, Jason and I have been in several conferences where we're starting to see employers start to purchase healthcare as a complete package, not just a plan. And so, there's, you know, for them to keep their costs down, they're starting to have some skin in the game as well. Education should occur when the person signs up for the plan, not when they show up for the services for the AHA. And you can't just slap on a high deductible plan, they say. You surround it with strong enough support to teach people how the consumers do um, or how, how, how good consumers provide incentives to them to maintain their health. I think I'm starting to see some really interesting benefit plan designs where, hey, if you go here, it's a $500 deductible. If you go there, it's no deductible. It's free to go to this other hospital because they have better outcomes and better quality. Um, Sharp is also getting into the game. They're saying the patient propensity to pay decreases. We've talked about that. According to a hospital's data, if they owe $500 or less, there's a 68% chance of collecting. This number drops to 36 and the balance is high at five or $6,000. This tells a hospital recovery story for high out-of-pocket costs. Our experience has been, according to Sabincar here, that, that patients have a capacity to pay, will pay, even if they feel the conditions are fair. So across the country, hospitals who've implemented point of service collections will assert that the benefits of point of service collections far outweigh the difficulties in implementing a process. By implementing technologies, policies, training, and support, hospitals and health systems in the near future will be more proficient in realizing improved and timely collections from a growing population of self-pay. This comes from a guy named Sonny Sanaville. Um, he's a CEO out of T-Systems. T-Systems designs emergency department uh, uh, charts, um, and he's even talking about uh, you know, where there's a large bad debt risk in, within the ED setting. Another poll question here, Jason will help us navigate through that, but uh, are you segmenting your AR into payment classes based on propensity to pay, charity, credit, or other methods? Yes, no, or not sure? Give a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds to get some votes in here. Got about 35% of uh, folks reporting so far, and Pretty good split, 37% saying yes, 40% saying no, and 22% not sure at this point. Seems to be holding pretty steady. Okay, so 62% of you are in a no or not sure category based off what Jason told me. Um, do me a favor when you get back, those of you that answered that way, and this shouldn't take you long. If you're a PFS director, ask your team, but go back and say, hey, what's our AR um, segmentation processing happening from a, from a collection standpoint? What's our early out at? What's their yield? What's our early out yielding at 30 days from a collection? You know, are they getting 80% of the dollars at 30 days? Are they getting 60% of the dollars at 60 days? Um, find out what you're spending on your collection. That's usually one of the largest expenses to a patient financial services is paying someone to go uh, collect that money. I was recently at a hospital in New York. Um, they brought a lot of their collections back in-house. And, and, and I was amazed to hear that. I applauded them. They're collecting seven, eight million dollars um, by doing propensity to pay and understand that patients really can and will pay you. Um, and they didn't have to just send them downstream. They were just losing um, dollars from, from downstream third-party collections. So stratifying your bad debt into these categories can help you focus on the accounts where you're going to yield dollars. And your folks are better than you think, than you think they are. Um, they really can't collect those dollars and are very skilled at doing so. So some industry best practices, stratify your patients. There's patients out there, like I mentioned, that'll pay automatically. There's patients that need your help, and there's patients that'll never pay you. So number two and three in this list require a lot of focus, right? You gotta have transparent conversations with them. Is this service elective or not? Are you gonna postpone it or reschedule it? My hospital and other hospitals would, would not put an elective surgery on the schedule until a funding mechanism was established. I'm gonna say that again. They would not put a surgery on the schedule until a funding mechanism was established. Now, that may alarm some of you, but what that did is that allowed the patient to not have a bankruptcy experience along with a recovery experience clinically. So we put that, we wanted to make sure, it wasn't that we weren't gonna do it, it was that we wanted to make sure the patient didn't get a bill in the mail for $50,000 with no conversation. That's irresponsible in my opinion. So we wanted to make sure we had really nice, tight workflows that helps patients understand what their costs were as these things were being put on the schedule. Because um, oftentimes that conversation um, was happening through an envelope and we were getting complaints about that. Providers are calculating a propensity to pay score, whether they're insured or not, and they're using a variety of sources. Um, and this, like I said, helps establish those funding mechanisms. This can help you rapidly determine if the patient in front of you is who they say they are, um, whether they qualify for charity or not, whether they actually can pay you or not, and how long it would take them to pay you. What is their collection score? Do they have a credit history? How well are they paying their bills? 
I love this slide. Our marketing team put this slide together, and it's a gorgeous slide. It talks through the different types of patients that can encounter your hospitals. So, you know, are they under 400% FPL? I'm seeing, you know, most gate to charity programs in the range of three to 600%. So, you know, if they're in there, that means that person should get an app at or ideally before they come in, right? Well, if they're on charity, you just saved all kinds of processes downstream if you can put them in there. And even better yet, if you're using third-party data, you could presumptively class them um, using community-based ratings. Um, identity. You have people that are sharing Medicaid cards, darn it. I mean, we have that at our hospital. It happens from time to time, right? And so, you know, is this patient who they say they are? Um, are they a red flag warning for you? Is this card who they are? Um, did they steal someone's identity? You owe that to your patients to understand, you know, where they fit and how they, how they reside. Do you have someone that can pay you? Maybe they're a great payer. Maybe you're going to annoy the heck out of them by asking them for $1,000 that they would just pay like they normally would. Um, and then do you have someone that's on the bubble that you probably need to talk about putting a payment plan in place and doing those types of things? Best practices, the patient-friendly billing project is something that's in the HFMA. It's a great resource. The, the tag's there at the bottom. But they're saying you need to have a clear charge master. Um, it all starts with your price. Do you have $55 eggs? If you do, why are they $55? And if they're supposed to be $55 and everybody else is charged $55, great. But what's your strategy in terms of how you're pricing things? Are you checking eligibility? Are you verifying your patient benefits? Are you doing pre-certification proactively? Are you retrospectively looking at your denials and seeing which ones made it or not? Are you looking at your referrals? Identification and patients out of pocket, doing it before they get there is best practice. Having financial counselors adjacent or at registration at scheduling to where they're just there and they're turnkey is also a best practice. And then you're always going to have these special handling accounts where folks, you know, want everything. Saying nothing, gang, staying quiet. Those of you that answered no or not sure on some of those poll questions earlier um, creates confusion. Tell patients what to expect and what they're more likely to, it, it, it helps. The ask is huge. Anybody you talk to talks about the ask. Um, we've talked about a lot of this with the patient's ability to pay, but explain those amounts are due. Establish payment terms early in advance. Approach to payment arrangements may include requiring minimum monthly payments. So again, I think you're going to see this trend of patients needing to finance their care um, as they go. The patient has to be first. They shouldn't be treated like a loan or a bank or an automobile car or, or a mortgage. There is clinical things happening here, gang, so please don't take that the wrong way. What I'm saying is, is that because the costs have shifted and what Jason and I have shared with you today, there has to be conversations from a financial nature too. Otherwise, the patient's going to be very, very upset with you and have a very bad outcome in terms of, of how they're funding their care. <clears throat> with effective programs in place and technology and tools and trained to deliver top-notch service, health care organizations in the vanguard of point of service collections are finding patients not to be resentful but grateful. Note the date on this quote, and I kept it in here. It's almost 10 years old. Um, you know, th this was an HFMM article. It hasn't changed, gang, was my point in keeping it here. I, I think the market's going to force us into that change as we collect um, and change our, change our collections practices for our patients, um, if not but for them, uh, is, is the message I'd like to leave with you today. We've got a gift for you for, for suffering through Jason and I today. Um, we've got a takeaway. Um, we've got this uh, toolkit that we put together that talks through um, uh, revenue cycle, uh, best practices, some stratification of debt, um, keys to collecting, um, some KPIs where you can kind of score yourself, um, high balance workflows, those types of things. Um, TransUnion offers a full suite of solutions. I always want to mention that we are here to help both as a resource to help you navigate your revenue cycle as well as providing tools and solutions in, in, in various aspects in, uh, uh, in the front uh, and, and back of your revenue cycle to understand you know, how you can identify patients that need your help and how you can identify coverage that was out there that you may not have known about. Final poll question, if you'd like to receive our toolkit, answer yes. Hopefully we'll get lots of yeses here as Jason goes through. It's free anyway, all you gotta do is answer yes and uh, it'll, it'll come on down. I think you have to provide us some stuff, but we'll figure that out. And I'll hold here for a minute because I know we need to look pretty strong. Looks like a lot of folks are interested in it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to boogie on. We're at the questions portion now. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, like I promised. Uh, and so um, we'll, uh, Jason and I will kind of navigate these as they come through. He's got a list of a bunch of them in front of them. So 
Um, and Jason, you feel free to answer ones that, that you want to answer and ask me ones that you'd like me to answer. We'll just kind of dive in. So Sharon asks, what are you doing as a company to address this issue? Cool. Yeah, so I'll start with that. Um, I don't know if these slides will go backwards. Um, I think oops, I'll go here. So, you know, TransUnion really is trying to play, if you look at my screen, in terms of a, a being front end to help identify, uh, you know, patients, uh, help make sure that patients' insurance is in place and eligible, determining payments like we talked about. So we're putting tools in place that help uh, bridge the gap between the insurance company, the patient, and, and, and the hospital or, or provider, if you will. And so, you know, knowing that data and knowing the answers to those responses early in advance is huge, right? If you know someone can't pay you and they have a high deductible, you're going to have a dramatically different insurance uh, conversation with them. If you know someone doesn't have insurance and they're coming in for a $60,000 procedure, you're going to have a dramatically different uh, conversation with them. If you know someone's insurance expired and maybe they didn't know it, you're going to have a different uh, conversation with them about that. Here's another good one that came in from Emma. She asked, how do you expect these practices um, to change with the potential switch to outcome-based uh, pay versus butts and beds? Cool. Thank you, Emma, for the question. Yeah, um, and Jason, you might jump in here too. Jason's working on some projects with value-based care, but um, Medicare has, I think, at the latest statistics, about 30% of plans will be tied to some kind of quality metric coming up. And so what that means is, um, and, and, and if you go and look at some of this stuff, uh, HFMA has got a really nice blog from the chair from last year uh, that, that put this through. But they talk about how the wedges are changing within that. So, you know, is it outcomes? Is it uh, readmissions? Um, is it the patient's perception of the care while they were there? And how are those things changing? So I think, you know, how that's going to change is uh, if a hospital is getting paid on whether the patient felt the care was good or not, what is the patient's metric that they're using for the care? Are they using the bill? I would argue a lot of them are, um, and, and they're like, I don't know what they did, but it certainly wasn't worth 55 bucks for that dozen eggs, to my point. And so they're going to criticize based off other points. Those of you that have been in the industry, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The HCAP surveys, you know, you'd get a horrible rating because the food was cold or, um, or, or, the, or they found a, a, you know, a, a wadded up piece of paper in the corner, right? That had nothing to do with the trauma that came in where you saved their life and their family and, and they're able to walk again. It had everything to do with whether the hamburger that was served and how shiny the floor was. I think those things are going to start uh, becoming more uh, towards the forefront with value-based care as that patient perception of their care, both from a clinical and a billing standpoint, come into play. They're going to get weighed on that. I don't know if you have anything to add, Jason, but that's it. Right on target. Uh, I've got another good question here from Van. We talked about a little bit about this one, but. Uh, he brings it home. One thing I've never heard you mention is the education of patient access staff on proper collection procedures. Can you touch on best practices in educating hospital personnel on collection techniques? Yeah, I got a whole deck on that, and I'm happy to, if you email us, um, I think our emails are here at the end, and we'll share that with you. Um, uh, you know, I think your staff is your best asset, right? They're probably your largest expense in patient access, too, so um, they are going to be the ones delivering this message, and they can't fake it. Um, uh, I've had staff that have faked it, and the patient can tell they faked it. The staff have faked it. Um, one of our mantras in my, in my hospital was uh, for our patient access staff, do you want a hug or a paycheck? And I, and I mean that with love, but we really did have conversations about this is what you were hired to do. This is why we're doing it. This is how we should ask, when you should ask, when you shouldn't ask, um, when you should reach out for help from your supervisor, manager, director, CFO, so on and so forth. But having them feel supported and having them feel educated and empowered to carry on that point of service collections mission, that insurance verifications mission, that financial counseling mission is huge. I sat behind registrars collecting money for weeks just to make sure that they knew that it was important and that, that I supported them. And, you know, I, I believe it or not, I've been working since the time they had pagers. I had a pager on me. They had my number. They could page me, and I'd come up to the front desk and help a patient navigate an estimate. It's that huge. Having checklists and scripting in place is also a best practice, and I can send that stuff to you if you like. Okay. We're looking at the questions together, gang. 
Uh, I like that that one there. Okay. Yeah, so it, go ahead. Alan asks, is there an app to help patients understand estimates with their hospitals and primary care? Um, yeah, so um, in TransUnion Solution, we have a, a, a price shopper tool that is navigated on the hospital side um, to where uh, a patient can call in and you can type in just a few pieces of information or they can be received through your HL7 and you could, you could uh, 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 tell the patient back uh, that the piece that you need from the patient obviously is what procedure they're getting. So it's kind of like when you, you remember the olden days when you'd actually call an airline to find out how much <laughs> a ticket cost. Um, they'd have to ask what your destination was. That's how our shopper works. You're seeing some portal and transparency thing, but if you go look, the adoption rate by patients is very low. That's what I was alluding to um, earlier. You hear a lot about transparency and consumerism, and it makes the hair on my neck stand up every time I hear those terms. Because if you go out and look in the industry, the adoption's in the single digits, gang, um, for patients actually going out to a portal and looking up a cost. And so um, TransUnion's positioning itself for when the market's ready, um, but right now we feel that the best practice is to do estimates in advance and provide them to a patient. Um, and so getting things scheduled 90% of the time, running an estimate on 100% of those scheduled patients, providing that estimate to the patient in advance, be it envelope, I've seen that, be it email, be it outbound calls, um, is, a, is a best practice. Okay. Um, hmm. Interesting in this one here. Yeah. So Tony asked, uh, what is your point, uh, what is service uh, hiring strategy? Collectors, customer service, where does it fit in the organization essentially? Yeah. So we had to do a, a, a wash, wax, and dry of our, <laughs> our, our um, uh, hiring process. So first, you, you know, we had to look at what the skill set was at current state. Your registrars are turning into what I call schedistrars or financial clearance specialists these days. They have to know a lot. Um, they have to know insurance rules, how the scheduling system works how the registration system works if they're not the same. Um, all the exceptions that are related to those, how a credit card machine works, how an estimator works, and, and, unless it's integrated, those types of things. And so, um, first of all, understanding what that skill set is and making sure that the, that, the, that the person has all those skills as you hire them um, is huge. I'll, I'm not gonna lie to you, it was very hard to find folks. We had to train up who we had, and then we started, we changed our job descriptions to say, hey, if you've got some hospital experience, that's great, because that's one less thing to walk through. Um, and then we'd also, you know, would do lots of educational seminars. Hey, let's role play. Hey, let's once a quarter have a, a room to where you guys learn about the new plans that just came on board that we inked for the hospital, those types of things to where they really became the experts. And what was beautiful is that the clinicians in the hospital would start approaching them. Hey, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, their new plan, do you know about that? Oh yeah, I know, we just learned about it. And they have a hundred dollar, they have a hundred dollar copay for ED and it's a thousand dollar uh, co-insurance typically, we're starting to see patients come through um, and, and have them be kind of the, 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 the conduit between the patients and the providers. So that, that was our strategy. I hope that helped. Anna had a good question, and it was about, uh, about whether most hospitals have a dedicated uh, person to research propensity to pay. This might be a good one to speak to. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, TransUnion does offer a solution which could help, and typically you utilize a solution like that with a financial counselor or possibly a registrar. You'd want to do that as far uh, in the front of the process as possible would be ideal. So. Yeah, and, I, and to add to that, I think, you know, it's a tool, right? And so you've got folks collecting money from your patients. Um, are they collecting money in a traditional way that's highly high touch, um, and Jason could allude on this too, but is that phone calls, is that transferring accounts downstream to collection agencies versus, hey, this person's got a really high collection score. If I call them of it, they'll pay me and rank, stack ranking that. Boy, we used to have competitions in my hospital to where we'd have million dollar days and people would like freak out because they hit a million dollar mark in one day um, using P2, P2P tools. So I hope that helps. Maybe if it's out here, do you want to? Uh, yeah, let me look. We're just looking at other questions here, guys. How does the shift to patients as payers impact ability, offer access to new technologies, medications? We'll continue to change. So if I'm reading that the right way, I'll repeat it. So how does the shift to patient benefits impact a patient's ability to pay and how they're onboarding to services is how I would interpret that, that, that message. I think it's going to be huge. I, I talked about financing care. Um, there's a drug out there. I'm not sure what it is. I, I think it's a Hep B drug. I'm not sure. It's like 10 grand a dose, and a patient needs it like for a week. 
That's seventy thousand um, dollars. I don't do the finances in my house. My wife does, and she's very good at it. Um, if I went and asked her for seventy thousand dollars, or if we had seventy thousand dollars come into our family finances, things would have to dramatically change. And so, is that person eligible for charity? Am I eligible for charity? Is that is that drug able to go through some sort of donation program if I don't have an ability to pay? Um, if I have an ability to pay, how much should I pay? You know, as these costs keep getting pushed to the patient, they're going to want to know what they are. And I think for folks on the phone, what's important for you to understand is, is this person in the, in the sphere of I can pay it? Or is this person in the, in the sphere of I can't pay it? And how can you tell the difference to where you can have a conversation with them to go, I think you could pay this. And here's how. And, and have a positive outcome with that. I think that's we're going to see more of that in the industry as, as uh, costs shift on these high cost uh, procedures. Yeah, it's a little scary. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so this is a question that comes in from uh, Bev. Um, excuse me, I've got my names mixed up here. Yeah. Yep, from Bev. Do any hospitals uh, on the webinar today have a program that assists patients with contacting their insurance for purposes of prior auth in addition to educating on out-of-pocket expense? Yeah, so I'm not sure how we'd be able to answer that today, but I could talk about what I've seen in the industry. So um, I mentioned in one of my slides that prior auth is probably one of the hottest topics right now. It's a, it's a meteor <laughs> um, in terms of the market right now. Um, the, the carriers have changed their rules. Um, they have changed their rules to lower premiums. I used to work for an insurance company, so I could say that. Um, that is the only reason why the rules have changed. Um, they're trying to bridle the costs. Um, but, but really, it's mainly to keep premiums in check. And so in that regard, um, there are pre-certifications now. There's uh, proprietary, I would argue, medical necessity rules and responses that come back from the insurance company um, that are somewhat clouded um, and not articulated in a, in a 5010 code set, like a 270, 271. Um, or, and, and so because of that, uh, or an 837, one would argue, and so the 215, 216, 217 transactions that exist in auth have not evolved to the level of maturity that those other transactions are. What that means in English is there's lots of noise. And so does this require authorization or not? Well, no. Well, what does no mean? Well, kind of. Well, you can't kind of have an auth or not. Um, and so what I talk through uh, when I talk about authorizations is, is I think a best practice is knowing which ones do or do not definitively, using a tool that does that. TransUnion's building one. It'll be out on the market, we hope, next year. Um, and then as, as, as those answers come back that are a no or I'm not sure, then you're you know, recording conversations with that insurance company going, hello, Insurance Lurch. Um, I have Jonathan in here, and he's getting a, uh, uh, a stent placement in his heart. Is that covered or not? Why, yes, it is, Mr. Wick. Okay, or Lurch, great. That's recorded. And then when the claim denies later, you can replay that conversation back to them and say, hey, I'm going to get paid now. And there's software out there that does that now. hope that answers the question. Uh, hi again, Jonathan and Jason. Um, I want to thank you again and thank our presenters for their excellent presentation and um, for our audience members for participating today. Uh, we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Um, and this concludes today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon.